It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. I'm Kyle Hyman here with Dr. Lewis Pearson and Dr. Alex Giltner. Thanks for being here, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank I, you. I just want to hand everything over to you, but before, uh, congratulations on the new baby. Thank you, yeah. Dr. Lewis. And congratulations on your engagement. I didn't Thank realize you. until after the show yesterday, our guest yesterday, Mary Beth Baker, is your fiance. Yeah, unfortunately so. for her, but, but great for me, yeah. <laughs> no, congratulations Thank to you. both of you. All right, well, you've got a, an opening. Is this a, what, what are we ref- reflecting on here? Sure. So um, at St. Francis, before every class, before every meeting, basically before every interaction I'm going to have with people, I start with a prayer. Uh-huh. And uh, I was spending a lot of time every day finding the prayers or writing a prayer or something. And so uh, I just bought the series of books, the 365 books, a prayer per day. Yeah. Um, and it's made things easier. I just, I look at them all, I find the prayer that'll work. Uh-huh. So uh, let's start uh, this segment with something from a book called Daily Companion for Caregivers. Okay. Uh, this is for September 19. And they all have the same structure. It's a quote, a reflection, and then a prayer. Prudence is the virtue that disposes practical reason to discern our true good in every circumstance. Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1806. Reflection. Faith and reason go hand in hand. The problem arises when we try to discern the good in situations where the good to be achieved is not clear. While perfection only exists in heaven, we can certainly use both faith and reason to make our decisions. What we may see as caring may not always be best for the other person involved. Think, pray, and then act, and trusting all to God. Prayer. Jesus, guide me in making prudent decisions, especially when others are involved. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for that. I like that. I feel like was that specifically chosen to fit a little bit of our theme for today? Yeah, so I've got, I don't remember if I said it, 12 of these books, and uh, we've got different segments today. So I went through all 12, <laughs> thinking which ones will fit most yeah. likely what the Spirit wants to do with us today on air. So what should we tackle first? What do you think, Alex? I'm kind of the, the tag-along <laughs> comic relief here, I think, today. I'm just, uh, I'm here to make you look good. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I have to make myself look bad. Yeah, well, so uh, Alex... That's usually my job. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you get a break today. All right, good. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, Alex is our um, director for the theology program at the University of St. Francis. I'm the philosophy program director, so I guess you got faith and reason and persona. Uh, oh, yeah. And the yeah I'm teaching a faith and reason class right now, yeah. actually. So. Yeah. Uh, but when we teach our classes, how we designed our curriculum does... It is impacted by the way that we see our faith informing everything that we do. Mm-hmm. A lot of the classes that students take from me at the university are ethical foundations classes. Every University of St. Francis student has to take at least one philosophy class, and ethical foundations is typically the one they choose to take. Okay. So if you think about ethics, you hear that word, and then you hear, I have to take a class in it. Uh-huh. Right? Uh, the typical picture people get, and I'm thinking people most likely who aren't listening to Catholic radio all the time, people who just you know watch... CNN or Fox News are just people who don't really, you know, have a, a mooring in a tradition that talks about the moral life. Mm-hmm. They think, oh, it's whatever people think or, or how they feel or how they were raised and there's no right or wrong. Right. And if I have to take a class on it, oh, I'm going to have this book that tells me, oh, if, if you're this kind of person, this is your, your kind of ethics. You like uh, duty ethics. You follow principles. It's like a personality test, right? Like that this, yeah. everything is like social media. It's like suited to who you really are. Yeah. So your moral compass itself is answer these questions about Harry Potter and then you're this kind of moral person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so a few of the um, influences in our culture that, that we're facing when we're trying to teach how to live well, uh, one of them is relativism, the idea that, well, you do you and I, I'll do me uh-huh. and uh, never the twin shall meet. If we disagree about fundamental principles, that's all right, you know, because I make my choices for myself. Right. And so relativism is the idea that a moral standard is relative to the person or the culture uh, that espouses it, which basically means it's no standard at all because you just pick and choose what you want. The standard is supposed to be the thing that's stable against which you measure your actions to see if you're succeeding or failing. Mm -hmm. But if it's whatever you want, it's it's not functioning as a standard is supposed to function. So if I'm a relativist and I'm, I'm used to thinking this way, there's no right or wrong, think about what you want to think about, I'll think my own thoughts. Imagine this kind of person coming into a classroom and the 
the professor has this book, and the book says, all right, chapter one, we're going to talk about virtue ethics, uh-huh. how to be a good person through the developments of character traits like courage and moderation and justice. Two weeks follow. This week, we're going to talk about uh, duty ethics, how ethics is a matter of doing things because it's your obligation as a human person. Another week. Now we're going to talk about maximizing pleasure for the most people, utilitarianism. Mm-hmm. Right? Anyway, you finish your semester, and more or less, it's what I call the Baskin-Robbins approach, but it's what most textbooks are doing. So every week, you're getting a new system, so to speak. Uh-huh. And by and large, if you're coming in with a lens that tells you everything's relative, mm-hmm. it's going to be difficult for you as a student to really plug in and, and evaluate whether this account of ethics is superior to the one that we covered last week. What you're going to think is, last week was orange sherbet, this week is chocolate. I like orange sherbet, so I'll just yeah. wait it out this week. Yeah. The, the way the textbooks are written, it already predisposes us to not getting through to students. Mm. The other problem I saw was, if you're not going to do it based on principles, let's do case studies. So let's talk about universalized health care or abortion or just war or something in the news about immigration, right? Uh, and then let the students go. The problem in most of these situations, though, is basically the classroom is nothing other than Facebook 2.0, right? So <laughs> the students already are getting in flame wars with their friends on social media or their frenemies or whoever they're, they're fighting with. They're not really learning more. They're only coming in with their unreflective opinions and finding after-the-fact justifications for those opinions. Right. And so they're not learning how to actually make ethical analyses. And so because these are the two main ways that textbooks are made today – uh, we've made intentional choices to teach ethics in a way radically different than the way that it's typically set up today in, in, uh, in the acad- a- academic world. Well, I want to hear more about and that. now I want ice cream. <laughs> 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 we got more coming up here on the Cal Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. What happens on the Kyle Hyman Show? Ooh, uh, good question. Good question. Good question. That's a really good question. That's a very good question. That's a great question. Great question. Yeah, you're onto something there, Kyle. Boy, <laughs> that's a great question. That's a great question. Ah, what a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. Great question. Great, great, great question, Kyle. Wonderful, wonderful question. That's probably one of the most challenging questions. Again, yeah, excellent question. Kyle, you stumped me. Um, I forgot what the question was. Find out weekdays from 7 to 8 a.m. This is Kyle Hyman, and with us today are Dr. Lewis Pearson and Dr. Alex Giltner from the University of St. Francis. We were talking about shifting from just kind of like showing all of these different examples of morals and different people believing different things and letting students choose from this, uh, I think you gave ice cream flavors as an example. What is the better solution to that? Uh, Well, let's uh, bring to Mary, and then she'll help us uh, talk about that better solution. Like it. Sure. Uh, This is from a book called Mary Day by Day. This is for September 19. Oh, Mary, I thank you for consenting to become the mother of our souls. Grant me the grace to love you and your divine son as you deserve. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. So uh, I also want to make clear for the listeners, what I talk about when I talk about how we uh, form our students is relevant to everyone's walk of life. If you think about the people you meet every day and you're trying to be a witness and you find uh, a brick wall, right? You... Anything you say gets reinterpreted and made safe and then put on the side. And so it's, it's difficult to get through to people to see, no, I'm, so, I'm saying something that's either true or false, mm-hmm. and it matters. And if I'm right, people who disagree have to address that, right? Right, right. We can't both be right at the same time if we're disagreeing about something fundamental here. Right. And so uh, what I see in my students is something I see in my, my daily life, that if I give a really clever, wicked person different accounts of this is what this ethical principle is and this is how it works, right? The person who's set on his wickedness isn't going to think, oh, thanks for that principle, now I know better. They're going to think, now I know how after the fact I can justify my actions to people. Hmm. So you think about people uh, at the highest echelons of uh, uh, corrupt business practices, it's not that they missed the business ethics class where they covered virtue, right? It's that they cared more about their profit or, or whatever it was and they would find ways because of their intellect to manipulate principles to serve their own gain. And so um, I saw that in the classroom, the same thing would be happening as happens in our daily life. If I'm hitting a brick wall, I'm saying good things, but people are reinterpreting it as, oh, that's just your opinion. Mm -hmm. I have to get down to basics and see, well, is your life flailing and, uh, you know, failing or is it flourishing? Uh 
what do your relationships look like? Uh, why is it you're always frustrated when you go to practice and coach says something and you can't take that critique well? Mm. So basically focusing on vices um, and then also virtues, right? The, the habitual ways that the character traits that we develop through our daily choices that lead to flourishing uh, or flailing. Mm-hmm. And as I do that, it's, it becomes less a classroom and less like when you're doing personal witness um, with friends and coworkers, less like I'm giving you a lesson and you listen to me and say yes because I'm the one who knows mm-hmm. and more a matter of, uh, well, something like counsel, right? You're, you're talking about your shared um, blessings and your shared challenges. And along the way, oh, by the way, that, that goes by the name moderation and it tells you that you're currently a slave to your desires. And that might be one reason why even when you get what you want, because your desires are telling what you to do, uh-huh. you're still unhappy. So moderation is a way of telling you how to master those so that you're in control, not your desires. Mm-hmm. And so when it's, when it's peppered in that way, they start to hear it with willing ears. Mm-hmm. And um, it starts to basically develop that formative foundation you need for people to actually listen and understand how principles for living well matter. And they're either true or false. And so mm-hmm. you have to evaluate them on their own grounds. So uh, I'm actually giving a presentation about this at a conference next, uh, next month. The conference is actually about character in institutions. Can you teach character in an institutional way? Can an institution have a character? Is this open to the public? Or is well, this is actually, conference? this is going to be in Texas. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> the, yeah, the conference that I'm presenting at. But uh, it, it developed because as we're creating our curriculum, we, we ask questions like, well, how can you assess whether students are becoming good people? Okay. Right. Well, um, that's a good question. <laughs> But we're not going to let that stand in the way of our trying to do something that we see as a good. Because hopefully, as a Catholic institution, that is a greater concern to you than they are getting good grades. Yeah, yeah. Them becoming a good person, more important than they are getting good grades. Yeah. And I'll tell my students, I say, so what I'm about to say, forget for now. Okay. <laughs> but in six months after this class is over, I don't care if you forget all the names, all the isms, all the, all the principles. Yeah. I want you to have been formed in such a way that you are a better person who can understand yourself and others mm. uh, in the light of the good of God. But if you don't remember who, who Plato is, that doesn't really bother me too much. <laughs> yeah. Don't think that now because you're going to be tested on that right now. <laughs> right. In the future, that's, that's my, my long-term hope for the student. It's help laying the groundwork for what you're trying to teach them. Yeah. 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 I did want to say one thing, sort of a, a, a hard swerve here. Uh-huh. Uh, so we, we had a lecture last night on, uh, on campus. Yeah. James Matthew Wilson. It, it, was, it was spectacular. I'll just say this. When my wife asked how it went, it was very high powered. It, mm. he, just, he just went after it. And so it was a good mix of community members, faculty, staff, students. And uh, if I just had to guess, I'd say a, a good number of people just didn't follow. And uh, I was talking about this with, with Angela and uh, my, my wife. I said it was a great example of what a community looks like <laughs> because so often when we want to reach people, we water it down. And like with our Catholic faith, when we give witness, we water it down to this sort of anemic secular morality. So why should they care about your Catholic faith? Right. Right. Uh, sometimes you should just let the weird show, let the, you know, let the difficult <laughs> show and, and it makes it clear. Uh-huh. No, we had to work at this. This is hard. Yeah. And I thought it was just a, a, a brilliant witness that we had this great, speaker from Villanova uh, who came down to give this talk, who was talking with the, the faculty and staff at this really high level. And the students just got to see modeled for them. This is what it looks like when you love God with mm. your whole mind. Just reading the description of it, I was like, I'm not sure what this means, but I'm really interested <laughs> because it was talking about beauty, but then these different worldviews and yeah. yeah. Oh, Alex, uh, I mean, he, he used it as a very explicit segue. A lot of his students came and at the Q&A party saying, now, students, didn't that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, I, I, is it my turn? Is that how this works? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, 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 this I think f- he passed the baton. Right? Yeah, so uh, this is my first time on radio, actually. Maybe you're not supposed to say that. So I'm still like thinking, like, where are the wizards? Uh-huh. Uh, how does this magic work? And his name's Robert. He's yes, on the other side of the glass. Yes. And he's actually a cleric. Uh, but in any case, uh, don't think too much about that. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, what what students seem to think is that, uh, and this is part of their relativism, what relativism does is it breaks down the world into basically preference and non-preference. Okay. And then it makes a perfect kind of fallow ground for consumerism to kind of eat you up because consumerism is ordered towards desire. 
Um, it's not about true or false. Right. It's it? about what do I want yeah. and how do I get it? And so they see college a lot of times as this sort of thing that they have to – they pay the money or their parents pay the money. Mm-hmm. And then they, they're not paying for time with experts. They're paying for a degree right. to go out and get a job so that they can make the money. Uh-huh. And – this sort of approach gives them this sort of feeling of, I have a right to just understand this and get my grade and move on. Mm-hmm. And they don't have a sense that like, no, this is more like you have to show to me that you have actually absorbed and engaged this material in a real and meaningful way. And so when students uh, sometimes get frustrated because they don't want to think, they think of thinking as work. Mm-hmm. Like thinking is this work thing that I have to do similar to it's hard. It is hard, yeah. um, but it's not desirable to be in hard situations. So I should avoid it. Right. Unless I have to do it similar to like digging a ditch or something. Uh-huh. And and it, they don't think about it thinking more in terms of like exercise. I do this so that I can train my mind like I train my body so that it is capable of certain kinds of maneuvers, certain kinds of physical expressions like dance or something like that. Mm -hmm. They don't think of thinking that way. And so part of what you want to help them see is like, no, I don't want, don't, I want you to understand things, but I refuse to dumb it down for you. I want you to gird up your loins and rise to the occasion Mm. and actually do the work of learning. Because this is not just some hoop that you jump through so that you can get on with your money-making life so that you can someday have the car you want or the TV you want and be a really dull person who has no idea how to talk about meaning or art or goodness and beauty. Mm -hmm. And so uh, part of what we do, you know, similar to, to what Lewis said about, you know, I don't care if you remember who Plato is. I want you to be a good person. My job's a little easier because I don't have to say, like, do you like this kind or this kind in terms of theology? I can just say, this is what the Catholic Church teaches, and she teaches it because it's true. Right. And so what I'm doing in the classroom is I'm trying to get students to actually stop and look around and think about how crazy it is that, like, existence is happening right now, (laughs) Uh that we're all just here doing this thing and we're taking it for granted, when actually there is no principle – That's just sitting out there that says things ought to exist, by the way. Mm -hmm. You got to actually engage reality. And before you can do that, you you have to remember that reality is a strange sort of thing. (laughs) It's a different kind of thing that that really doesn't just give itself its own explanation. You have to meet reality and you have to engage with it and negotiate with it and figure out what's going on. And they confuse that with relativism, but it's not relativism. One of the things Matthew James brought, James Matthew brought up last night in the talk was we think about the world as object, but we've forgotten what objection is. He used this metaphor of a lawyer standing up to the judge saying, I object. You know, I am a subject who does an action, a verb, towards an object, but an object isn't just sitting there. Reality as an object outside of us is objecting to us. It's throwing itself at us, objectus, which is to throw away or throw toward. Hmm. Um, So the Latin, I like Latin. Okay. Um, So reality is, is injecting itself into our lives. And we have to take that seriously and not try to avoid it with money. And so uh, one quick example, and then I'll stop talking, I suppose. (laughs) You know, I asked my students and they all get it immediately. how many of you have seen car commercials? Okay, everybody mm-hmm. has. How many of you have seen car commercials that actually talk about the car? Right. Very few. Right. What, maybe 20% of them actually say, this car has this newfangled thing. Right. Most of them, it's like it's like it's a truck driving through mud. Right. And some Sam Elliott. It's tough. Yeah, Sam Elliott's over right. going, American made, work hard. Or it's this, you know, big, like, you know, start out really, really far away and moving into this autumn forest. Uh-huh. And a car is flying down a windy road. Uh-huh. And someone's going, freedom, experience, <laughs> Jeep. And they're not selling you a car. They're selling you an identity. They're selling you a reality. Or Matthew McConaughey is just talking oh, gibberish. Right, yeah. right, right, right. All right, all right, all right. Doesn't make any sense. Is, this is a great car. Uh, and so, and so, <laughs> what we need to do because because the people who are selling us things, they get this. They're not stupid. They understand that we're hungry not for cars or or food. We're hungry for real, actual reality. Uh-huh. And. 
they say, yeah, 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 but this will get you that. Right. But it doesn't. It just expires and then you need more. Right. And then you are in relativism and consumerism come together to make a perfect kind of endowment or fund for people who have money and time to manipulate to make more money Mm -hmm. through the manipulation of goods instead of actually ordering us to the good, Mm -hmm. the beautiful, knowing that these things are things that only last for a second that are supposed to point towards the greater, deeper reality, which is, of course, God. Yeah. And I think the inability to see this is sometimes immaturity, sometimes cowardice. I'm talking about myself. I see so many people more and more every day, older people in particular, who just want to talk to me. Hmm. Um, And it's clear they they want to have meaningful contact, intellectual contact. And for some reason, they they can't or they don't with their family or their coworkers. Uh, Maybe they don't get along with them or they're afraid. If they talk this way, they're going to jeopardize themselves at their job. Um, I found I did the same thing. when I was at a men's conference, I tried to talk about anything under the sun except for Jesus. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, we're here for Jesus. And I was just afraid to talk about it because I didn't know what I was doing at that age. Yeah. All right. Well, so much more to talk about. We'll have it coming up here with Dr. Lewis Pearson, Dr. Alex Gilter, my special guests here on the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman and joining me as co-hosts and guests today, Dr. Lewis Pearson and Dr. Alex Giltner from the University of St. Francis. Thanks for being here, guys. Thanks Thanks for having us. If you don't mind, I'd like to start this half hour with a reading about, uh, well, the Holy Spirit. All right. And this is from a book called Daily Meditations with the Holy Spirit. So there's a scripture verse, a reflection, and a prayer. However, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. Reflection. We communicate what we're really about by the way we live our lives. If we are concerned with our comfort and amusement, then we will be shallow. If we are consumed by anger and resentment, people will realize that something is wrong. But if we dedicate ourselves to prayer and study and compassion, people will sense that we are one with God. Prayer. Lord, may I only and always live for and in your spirit. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holy spirit. Well, that does address everything we're talking about right now. Yeah. Almost like it was written for that this very day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's the Holy Spirit for you. <laughs> yeah. Holy Spirit's my homie. Yeah. I, it's interesting, you know, when you think of the three persons in our prayers, and we have prayers to each of the persons um, of the Trinity. Jesus is the mediator. He's the most relatable for many reasons, metaphysically and and psychologically. But uh, the Holy Spirit for me, uh, the last five, eight years of my life has just really become uh, the person uh, with whom I communicate best when I pray. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think triggered that? Uh, How do I make that transition? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, a little thing too. It was grace is people telling me. So for instance, I'm a quasi cradle Catholic. Mm Mm-hmm. When I was five or six, I, I asked to be baptized. Okay. And then I went to a parochial school. Uh, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, down in Memphis uh, at the cathedral grade school down there. Uh-huh. Also the Immaculate Conception Cathedral down there. But a bit like Augustine, I was uh, uh, had a divided will from the beginning. So I'd go to Mass during school, but I'd never ask my mom to take me to Mass. My mom's not a Christian. And I knew I should, but I never did. Uh, in college, I fell away. I'd become an atheist uh, after dabbling with Eastern religions and all, all kinds of other things. Mm-hmm. In the genuine desire to know, what is true, right? So it begins with, with earnest inquiry and, and good, good yeah. intention, uh, pursuit of the good, but um, it devolves into despair. Mm. Uh, throughout all of that, however, I never was at a loss for knowing what was right and what was wrong, right? So just the, the basic understanding of the Catholic Church's teachings about morality and sexuality and contraceptions, those, those things, whether they did or didn't have anything to do with what I was doing with my life, I never strayed. Because I just thought that's just self-evident hmm. that these are truths about morals, and uh, people say, like a natural law. Or something <laughs> yeah, like who that. knew? <laughs> and so if someone's saying something like, uh, "But not everyone has this conviction that's so clear to them, right? right? Maybe they're lying to themselves. Maybe they are really confused genuinely." But someone would say, "That sounds like a gift of the spirit to me." Mm-hmm. And it was uh, little voices like that that would tell me the places where my life was on track with Christ. It was the spirit. And the more I started seeing 
they were right, the more it became, uh, I could discern the Spirit's action. I could see how what I wanted to do was being informed by Him when I was doing my best. Mm -hmm. So as a teacher, it wasn't me. It was Christ through me. Mm -hmm. Before my very first class in graduate school when I was going to teach, and I was at that point like four years older than the students, right? So um, I was really panicked, and I went out in the hallway, and I said the St. Francis prayer, Okay, make me a channel of your peace. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, I, I had a word of consolation, and I, I know now it was the Holy Spirit, that I had nothing to be worried about. It wasn't about me. If it was about me, of course, I should be frightened to death. Mm. It was about God's truth. Mm-hmm. All I needed to do was tell the students, hey, look at this. Mm-hmm. And it, it was easy from that point on. My wife, she hates attention. And at our wedding mass, she just hated being the center of attention, as brides often are <laughs> in, in, a, in a wedding. Um, uh-huh. Our wedding wasn't like that. And, and we're about to process in. And she looks at me. She's like, what are you grinning at? Because she's so deathly afraid about being the center of attention now <laughs> in certain guests' eyes, maybe, who aren't Catholic. Uh-huh. And Mary I said, Beth, are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, uh, we're about to have a mass. Like, there's a mass because of us. Mm. And she heard that and she smiled. Too, and then it went away. And she also just entered in the moment. It was about Christ. And we're bringing people to Christ because they showed up for a mass because mm-hmm. they wanted to be at our wedding. And anyway, during the break, we were talking about that, how odd it is just to look around at the world that we live in if you are new to it. When you grow up with it, you don't think about it. But yeah. I'm an adult revert to the Catholic faith. And Alec, you're, you're a convert. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, oh, was that? The... Well, <laughs> it, I thought the, the stuff we were talking about during the break was relevant because what we do in our classes is basically – evangelize to people who don't yet know that's right yeah and so so this does get into the the book that i'm writing right now uh it's called uh as of now it's called a different sort of cosmos a guide to the catholic imagination okay and so you know so much of what people think about education and learning and um even just uh thinking about the world they see as a kind of negotiation of content like it's it's about these propositions, these belief uh, that I hold or whatever, and they may or may not run into each other. They may or may not contradict each other. And um, and this actually goes to the lecture last night too, whereas what the way that we actually engage the world is something more like vision. Um, it's, a, it's an experience. It's not always sensor, uh, sensory experience, but well, and this is called the notion of the worldview. Mm-hmm. We view the world through these lenses and it does affect kind of how we engage and understand and make meaning out of the world. And so it, it's not that there's not a true meaning out there to find, which is why there are some worldviews that are good and some that are bad. Mm-hmm. Um, because they're more accurate, they're closer to the truth, or they're farther away from it. <clears throat> some help us to see, some hinder us. Exactly. It's uh, a worldview is, is not neutral. But it's actually um, meant to help us to really understand what's going on. So, you know, uh, the Emerald City originally in in The Wizard of Oz, in the actual book, it wasn't emerald. It wasn't green. It was shining bright light. And they had to put on these glasses. Huh. And they were green tinted glasses. And so that's why it was the Emerald City. Okay. Now, they just didn't catch that in like the Technicolor uh, you know, old movie, which I guess is fine. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen it in years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so what these worldviews do is they sort of act as these kinds of glasses. They don't like mean that we're not looking at all that looking at the same emerald uh, city. But emerald is a way of engaging that. The Catholic worldview, and this is probably this book comes out of myself converting and then trying to teach Catholic theology to some people who just don't understand it, including people who've grown up in the Catholic Church, uh, is is not just about a transmission of content. Um, so when I say, you know, the, no, it's not bread and wine, it's body and blood, they say, what? And if I quote Lateran 4 to them, they don't go like, oh, I get it now. Uh-huh. <laughs> There's something else going on, and that's what this book is trying to get at. I like it. Uh, I want to hear more. We've got just a little bit more time, but a lot more to talk about with Dr. Lewis Pearson and Dr. Alex Giltner from the University of St. Francis coming up here on the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman, and with us is Dr. Lewis Pearson and Dr. Alex Giltner from the University of St. Francis here in Fort Wayne. Thanks for being here, guys. Thanks for having us. Uh, Let's just start this last segment with... uh, a little something from Inspirational Thoughts for Every Day. It's the name okay. of the book. 
Do you still not understand? Mark chapter 8, verse 21. Reflection. It is good to examine our actions in light of who it is that saved us, what he did for us, and perhaps most importantly, what he said to us. A daily, evening examination of conscience mirrored in the light of the Lord's teachings can help us grow in God's love. Prayer. God of power and mercy, as we follow Jesus in all things, keep us on the straight and narrow. Be with us as we cleanse our conscience at the end of each day. Amen. Well, that's in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, Alex, uh, we talked about your book recently, and I was mentioning our conversations to, to my wife, Angela. And I told her one of the things I was really appreciating was how you pointed out the Catholic worldview lens, right, that I think helps us to see things rightly. Just because it makes sense of the world doesn't mean it's not weird, right? Oh, yeah. And in fact, um, if we hide the weird, we might actually, the downplay might prevent people from really seeing, no, no, this is, this is crazy, right? Oh, yeah. 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 In fact, um, I mean, to kind of back up again, the reality itself is really weird. We just, as, as you point out, Kyle, we, we grow up in it. And so it's just kind of normal, mm-hmm. but like it, it, people don't, I don't think very often stop and think, oh, we're on a big rock that's floating <laughs> by, we call it gravity, but we might as well call it magic. Cause who knows <laughs> around a big explosion that's been around for, I don't know what, 5 billion years. And there are other planets doing this too. And like, you think if I sat down to create a universe, I probably wouldn't think to do it that way. Right. We're thrown into weirdness immediately. What <laughs> is amazing about Catholicism is, is not, no, no, everything's fine. It's normal. It, 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 Catholicism, you're right. This is really weird. Now, check this out. The being who created it knows you better than you know yourself, gives infinite value to your existence, and then loves you and is willing to die on a cross for you and then feeds you with his flesh and blood. If you say that <laughs> under to, species of bread, <laughs> under species of bread yeah. and wine, uh-huh. and and you say that to someone, they you know it's not we hear about it because we know those crazy Catholics, but you actually say this to someone back in the first century, and you know you understand why people why like Justin Martyr saying no we're not cannibals mm-hmm. okay no we're not weirdos. Well, maybe we are, but understand why. Right. And and so part of the Catholic worldview, and this is why a quote from Lateran Four or a discussion about the distinction between substance and accident is not helpful to get someone to understand why do you think you're communing with Jesus and ingesting his actual body and blood at the Eucharist? Mm-hmm. It, it's a different way of seeing the world. The way Catholics see the world is truly via revelation, revelation from the Latin literally means to pull back the veil. And so in the the veil is the bread and wine, mm-hmm. but the deep meaning behind it is this body and blood. The world is mystery saturated with meaning. And what the Catholic lens actually does, far from mediating the world and making it something it's not, actually gives us ears to hear and eyes to see, as Jesus said, into the deeper meaning and reality That's actually behind the world. Hmm. So one quick um, analogy is, uh, and I I talk about this in in one of the chapters of this book that I'm writing, and is there was this study in 2014 or something um, that they looked at the host. I don't know how they got it, um, but uh, because I don't think a priest gave it to him. But in any case, Hmm. they 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 tested the host and they said, "Oh, the DNA is DNA is wheat." It's not, it's not body. Uh-huh. So you Catholics should give up this superstition. Uh-huh. And that really doesn't prove much except for when they think about Catholics, they have no idea what we're actually thinking and talking about. Mm-hmm. And in principle, their, their objection is no different than the objections at the very beginning of Christianity. And you pointed out this, uh, Lewis, when we were talking about this, at the very beginning – People didn't need the concept of DNA or the, 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 the method of scientific inquiry to say, now, when I eat other human flesh, <laughs> it doesn't taste like this. This is like bread. Right, right. Yeah, you they, don't need a lab for that. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so this is not about a concept of how the world really works in as much as it's really actually molecules and DNA versus those crazy uh, weirdos who thought that it was not. No, this is fundamentally about how the world is viewed. Is the world just sitting out there neutral and we're just supposed to kind of master it or is the world fundamentally itself a communication a revelation from a deeper transcendent reality who created it i.e god yeah it's, it's, mm. this is a gift oh right. by the way 
this is what I meant when I gave, gave it to you. You don't understand my gift. Here, this right, is how you work right. it. This is how you un- appreciate it. Right. Yeah. And that's what it means to be stewards. You know, the, the first uh, definition of the image of God is in Genesis 1. He says, let us make man uh, and woman in our image and likeness and give them, we translate it dominion over the world. Mm. But the wor- that word there really is like stewardship mm-hmm. because we can see into the deeper reality if we are in line with God Mm -hmm. and God's self-communication through creation, then we can actually in harmony see what the world is really doing and then manage it better. Mm -hmm. And so it's not about mastery. It's about, it's like parenting almost. Yeah, I understand in a very deep daily way why God set the world up in the way he did, giving us parents as an image of himself and then giving us children so that we can understand why. Do you have children? Yeah, well... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so n- number seven, uh, yeah. Mary, she was born last week. Yeah, yeah. congratulations. Uh, thank you, yeah. So, yeah, when we give a gift, like I give a bike and the kid wants to use it as a bat, you know, so, no, no, that's, that's, <laughs> that's not what it's for, it's for riding. And if you want to use uh-huh. it that way, don't ask for another one because you broke it. And, right. right. Yeah, it, it, it's not up to us to do with what we see in the world as we see fit. It's, just, it's up to us to figure out why is this here for me as this gift? You know? Right, yeah. right. And just real quick, I do know that Lewis has children. I'm, we're good friends. I was just <laughs> making a joke. But that's right. You know, creation is, it will, and that's what Catholics believe, different from a lot of other Christian denominations. Catholics see grace already infused in the world. We call it prevenient grace, which means the grace that comes before. And mm-hmm. that's because creation itself is a donation of being that doesn't merit itself. No, God didn't have to create us. God had no obligation to create us. Right. God creates because he's a gift giver. Mm. And creation itself is a gift because he didn't have to give it. Mm-hmm. You didn't merit being brought into existence. God gifted you or donated that existence to you. Creation itself is a donation. And every gift, if it's any good, will tell you a bit about the giver. Hmm. Yeah. And so Christ comes as a culmination of this gift in that the revelation, which is absolutely radical, and we've forgotten this, I gave you this gift to set up the real gift, which is my own self. That's Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is going to sound like a weird swerve. So uh, my wanderings on my way back to the faith, Plato was part of that. Mm. So I remember I had a grad professor. He said he thought in the Plato's Timaeus, it's one of his dialogues, that he read one of the best reasons for creation ever. So in the Timaeus, the characters are talking about how did the universe come to be and why does it have the order that it does. And one of the characters says, well, the God created the universe because God's not jealous. So basically, he he overflows with with this desire to to have his being uh, be given out. And uh, it's a a gift, right? Mm -hmm. This this gift, as you say, comes to its full meaning in Revelation through Christ's incarnation. one of the things that we're probably not going to have a lot of time talking about, though, is uh, so one of my expertise areas is, is Plato. Mm-hmm. How it is, I mentioned just now, Plato is part of my finding my way back to the faith. How I saw Plato as a kind of Greek John the Baptist calling out <laughs> in the desert, making straight the, the paths of the mm. Lord. Huh. Um, well, many Christians, even Augustine, basically say he's, he's, he's almost Christian. He just doesn't have Christ. He has everything else. Yeah, yeah. Outside of divine revelation. Yeah. Yeah. In The Republic, it's a book that many people probably know of because of uh, like the allegory of the cave. You might have heard of that. There's movies that are based on this, like the Matrix trilogy has this as part of the, the foundation of what it means to, to find yourself in a world and not know that you were put there. There's the story in The, in the Republic, if, if you don't know about it. Basically, children are put at the bottom of a cave, and this is supposed to be a metaphor for education. And so they're looking at shadows on a wall. Mm-hmm. And eventually they come to realize the shadows are just being projected by these puppets. They come to understand what the puppets are. These are just creations made on the image of animals. And these animals are visible because of the light of the sun outside the cave. So slowly they make their way out of the cave. But it's like going through grade school and high school and and college. At the bottom of the cave, when you see an image like on your television set, you think, oh, that's reality. You need to have the the mother's milk at the beginning, the shadows, right? The, you don't have the fullness. You don't teach the advanced lesson in physics to the four-year-old. You, you teach him, you know, what a lion is and what a bear is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you, you have the little puppets. And what happens in this story is a dilemma is set up, a dilemma that gets called in the tradition the, 
tension between the contemplative life and the active life. The contemplative life is the one where you, uh, in Christian terms, seek out and befriend God mm -hmm. and conform yourself to God's image. And the active life is one where you do God's work in the world. So it's love of God, love of love neighbor. neighbor yeah, and right. for the ancient uh, pagans, this is a clear tension. How do love of God and neighbor go together? They know that both are good. Plato, I think most of his dialogues point this out. They're, they're supposed to go together. Love of God sets you up to properly love neighbor. Mm -hmm. But how do you go out and look at the sun and be informed and then go back down in the cave and instruct the people there? We're finite. We can't do both at the same time. Huh. If only, and this is, this is, I think, a Catholic read of the allegory of the cave. If okay. only the sun itself could come out of the sky and enter the cave, then the contemplative and active lives would be. Right. We could look both up and down at the same time yeah. instead yeah. of only being able to do one or the other at any given time. So God incarnate huh. resolves that tension of the contemplative exactly. and active lives. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so, I mean, you really do see what Jesus means when he says, here are the two commands, you know, love God, love your neighbor. And one says, well, how do I do that? And then Jesus, look at me. Yeah. You know, mm. I, am, I am the embodiment of those commands. Yeah. Because yeah. I am the one who formulated them, gave them, because uh, as was slowly revealed through time, Jesus is God. Yeah. Providentially, that, that scripture passage is actually, I think, uh, part of an argument for why people who are Christian – have been given a command to study philosophy and theology. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm, we I'm have this. in several of the the synoptic gospels. Like, so in Matthew twenty two verse thirty seven, Jesus says, "Right, the first commandment is to love God with your whole heart, mind, you know, uh -huh. strength and soul, and so love with your mind." If I loved Alex and I never cared to know more about who he is, I'd be maybe an okay friend, but it's clear I could be a better friend. Yeah. Right. It'd be weird if I didn't ask questions of my wife and get to know her better. I could be an okay husband, but right. it's clear there's something missing in my love if I don't want to know more. And that has to do with the love of my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, engaging her with my intellect. Asking questions. Yeah. yeah. And then after I come to know, being able to appreciate and then being able to respond because of what I know. When Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the truth, mm -hmm. he is the truth. Mm. We're basically, if you think of these, these uh, verses together, so he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John chapter 14, verse 6. We're called to love God, who is truth, with our whole mind. Mm -hmm. That's philosophy. And the fact that he is God means that's also theology. Hmm. And if you don't care about these things because they're just these abstruse things that professors do in a classroom in this artificial environment and has nothing to do with daily life, uh, look at Matthew and John. Yeah. They're saying, no, this, is, this isn't about a book. Like a, like a textbook. If it's about any book, you could say the Bible. But this is about love of God who gives us himself and his creation, which tells us about him as its creator. Yeah. And so hopefully our university administrators are listening to how valuable <laughs> what we do is. <laughs> That's right. And how important it is that we continue to do it. And probably need a raise. That's right. That's right. <laughs> just for good measure. For, 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 for loving my neighbor, of course. That's and, right. You know, just, you know. Thank you both for joining me today. Appreciate it. Thank you.